Welcome to the Rooted in Podcast. I'm Rita Savasco, and today I'm talking to my good friend, Julie Bogart, good friend and colleague, Julie Bogart with Brave Writer. Thanks for coming, Julie. I love being here, Rita, of course. One of Julie and I's favorite things to do is to talk about how our fields kind of merge together. Um, In Rooted in Language, we're really trying to support parents and teachers who are teaching reading and writing, especially for struggling learners. And at Brave Writer, what are you doing at Brave Writer, Julie? I'll let you say it better than me. We're helping parents and educators coach their kids into a writing life. Ah, nicely put. Yeah. Thank you. So anyway, one of my favorite things to do is to kind of sort through some of the research that's out there and um, share that with Julie. And we love to have these conversations on our own. And uh, so I had read some research I wanted to share with her and I thought, well, let's just do it on a podcast. A big, juicy conversation. Yeah, right. Because (laughs) we have them and then we think, wow, that was really good. We should have shared that with someone. So um, what I'm talking about today is that the goal of education and educators know it. You see it everywhere. I just pulled up um, a, a homeschool conference where one of the speakers is talking about learning how to learn. It's kind of a buzz phrase yes. in that, you know, what we really want is to become lifelong learners yes. and to figure out how we do that best. And kids are in a process of learning that. They're learning how to learn, and that's our goal. And so this huge body of research was put together by a man named John Hattie and Gregory Donahue in 2016. And what they did is they looked at all of these different teaching Uh, methods and they looked at outcomes and they they statistically looked at different kinds of methods and what the outcomes were and which ones were uh, really powerful methods and so I've I've um, read through some of this and I'm here to tell you that a lot of what we're both doing is uh, showing good results not just in our work and with the people we work with who are giving us that feedback but in the research too but uh it's a lot to unpack so today i just want to talk about one piece of it julie great and it's this model of learning that john hattie put together that he talks about the skill the will and the thrill <laughs> first of all you gotta love you know anything that rhymes that's right, right. <laughs> right but right away you just start thinking about that no matter what you're talking about in learning you start talking about skill will and thrill and right away um i was just thinking about how you and i are on that continuum Yes, absolutely. In fact, when you first showed me those three words, I thought to myself, oh, I wish I'd thought of them. (laughs) (laughs) Not the truth. Because they do such a good job of summing up what are really the three components. You know, we often put our kids in a context where they need to work on a skill, but then we will be confronted with their lack of interest or their unwillingness. So we don't know how to engage their will. So then we try to make that skill learning fun. We try to give them the thrill so they'll have the will. So I know those are the three components. Really, it's a matter of how do we juggle those? When do we use them? Is the thrill part just a reward? Are we just using stickers and badges and bells Mm -hmm. and, you know, bribery? Right. Or is there intrinsic to the skill building a sense of joy, a sense of, you know, pleasure and competence that is the result? And I'm hoping that that's what he means when he's talking about thrill. It is, it is, yeah. (laughs) uh, Yeah, you're going to find that out. So, um, and I was thinking about, you know, a lot of times uh, people will say to us, well, I'm using Brave Writer, so if I use this rooted in language thing, like now is that going to fit in with Brave Writer? And, And what we do is so supportive of each other. So most parents are when they're looking for reading and writing, they want their kids to have a will to do it, right? That's our goal is that they have, they want to read and write. And, and when they come to Brave Writer, I think Brave Writer tends to work from a perspective of if you can picture, and we'll have a handout with this, that skill, will, and thrill are on a continuum, that Brave Writer does a really good job of starting at that thrill level and through that working back through developing more of a will and getting to the skill because you know you're you're you got to be writing to be a writer right you know and so and and 
what I've always been about is because I work predominantly with kids who struggle is what are the skills you can't you can't be thrilled about something that is too difficult yes and if it continues to be discouraging you'll even lose your will and so we've got to have that skill level and so the kinds of methods that we're trying to come up with is really moving on that other side of the continuum of how can we build up skills and work to a level of success so kids are encouraged and can get to will that, and then, that makes a lot of sense to me I think so often maybe it would even the model for me would even be better if it was a circle mm -hmm. because there is probably a place where you will start even just with the will I remember sure. Johanna waking up when she was five years old saying today I will learn to read well, three years later, <laughs> she right. read, but the will is, it kicked in. There was some aspect of reading that had caught her imagination and she was determined. Right. You know? And I would agree with that. I don't think, I think you're right. And um, when they talk about the model, they kind of talk about how whatever it is that kids are learning, they kind of have some um, bucket full of each of those, right? And um, and some buckets might be a little empty, and that mm. could be something we need to, to think about. And that even when you're in the midst of learning the task, then those buckets change again. Yes. So that the student might, and, and by the way, the teacher comes to a task with their own sense of skill. So let's, and will and thrill. So Good let's point. define that for a minute. So skill, they are defining as this basic achievement or basic knowledge. And then will is, is more this disposition toward learning, mm -hmm. right? We kind of have a sense of that. And thrill is that that more intrinsic motivation that kind of just keeps us, you know, fresh and alive on that topic so that you're, you have that bucket as you enter reading, right? And then you also have that bucket once you're engaged in reading and those, those levels can change. And then, of course, what we're hoping is at the end of education, like all the buckets are full, right? Sure. We want we want you to love reading and writing and want to do it and be thrilled about it and be super good at it too, yes. right? You know, and <clears throat> I think one of the things I like about this is, um, and I almost kind of responded on a Facebook, um, a Brave Writer, Brave Schooler Facebook about this is, you'll have people who will say, well, um, you know, I never really had to do anything about spelling. My child just did this and spelling just happened. Well, that child probably had a bucket of skill that's different maybe than your child's bucket of skill. So to just assume, you know, that just by the thrill of being exposed to words, that the skill bucket will fill up isn't always the way it works for every learner. Right. Absolutely. And it will vary subject area to subject area. Sure. So you may have a child who's naturally adept at taking in spelling, taking in reading, taking in language, and then move them into num numerals, numbers, and suddenly they are finding the whole subject area opaque. And it's really challenging. And I, I agree with you on this. It's really challenging to commit your will to something that you expect to fail at. So there's a difference yes, between absolutely. having the motivation based on making the environment fun. You know, I have parents who say to me, I did everything to make it fun and they still didn't want to do it. Well, it's possible then at that point that they're either lacking a basic skill and mm -hmm. they don't want to risk failing again, or their will has never been engaged. All they see is like all this paraphernalia around the learning, but the actual thing is not interesting to them. Yeah, right. So I would say that that basic level of uh, skill that gives you the courage to even try is a lot what you do. Right. You're helping kids get to that place where they're willing to commit some energy. They don't see failure as the only possible outcome mm -hmm. of their effort. And and I think that um, parents will say, I just hate it that working on this is is a drudgery and how can I make it more fun? Well, there's, there's some real value in that, right? So, you know, we do try to make things fun. But th there is also truth that as long as something is a struggle, it's not very fun. Exactly. You know? So 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 no matter how exciting you make it, no matter how much you know, the only best excitement sometimes is to avoid it completely. But then what? 
you know so then do you not write do you not read you know so so those aren't good options in our society and they're very limiting to to life in in our society and so we've got to figure out ways to also help kids understand that that the more we can do this the more fun it becomes because you have that skill now and it's one of the reasons we talk about trying to um, do things in these smaller bits and pieces of learning because you can have success with that one bit of learning then now that's thrilling well that's my uh, catchphrase that I share a lot is lower the bar to experience success yeah (laughs) (laughs) say it all the time (laughs) Because typically what's going on with kids and parents is, especially parents, is that they're just asking for too much Mm -hmm. from a child who is not yet at a skillful level. Mm -hmm. And that's very draining. The analogy I like to use is your child learns to ride a two-wheel bike and you say, oh good, now that you know how, here's a unicycle. Yeah. You know, they don't even get to enjoy having mastered the bicycle before you're already pushing them into this other challenging skill. So one of the things that I think is helpful to keep in mind and that you've helped me think about over the years too is when a child is facing chronic failure or over and over feels like what they're doing is not producing the correct result it's reducing the size of the task Mm -hmm. to something where they do experience success right and providing a level of support for that risk You know, we tend to feel like we're not supposed to be involved and really it's the other way around. When the child is showing the biggest level of struggle, you don't have to tap dance to get them interested. They need to feel that you are their comrade, you are their champion, you are their companion on this struggle and you'll do it in small manageable bits right while they're putting in that hard work right right and and not to the degree I think what also can be a risk is that supporting sometimes becomes doing it for them which is okay sometimes but not all the time so we do a lot of work on um, yes you want to tell this big story absolutely this is the time I, I will be your scribe but now that we're working on this one little sentence this is the time that I will help you be successful for yes. you putting pencil to paper and that can be a difficult thing to do you know well one so. of the things just to piggyback off of that one of the things I learned from you way back when this is probably back when we were in co-op together but I was talking with you about the jot it down practice where the child talks and the parent jots it down and you said one of the transition points that is valuable is for the child to tell the parent the words And then the parent acts like the CD-ROM that holds those words. And now you dictate them back to the child. So the child is actually writing their own words, but they don't have to think of them. They already thought of them. And now you're providing them with the, you know, sort of dictated language. Right. And so that they can be successful. So that they can be successful so that they're starting to pivot towards transcription of their own thoughts right but there's that intermediate step and, they and need, I love that idea yeah they need lots of intermediate steps I mean one of the things just to kind of you you brought that up that there are areas of skill that we all have we all have different working memory capacities mm. and you and I had done a big uh, video yes um, webinar about that Um, they have different cognitive abilities kids have different language skills they have a different culture of encouragement and expectations in their lives and we see that you know we know what our own family cultures are and and kids kind of have their own little internal cultures which can be different I think all three of my kids had different internal cultures to how they approach learning Um, a quote I like that uh, I have on our handout here is is the most important single factor influencing learning is what the student already knows ascertain this and teach accordingly love that and there's so much about what I try to do of ascertain where are they what are their strengths let's build on that but also where is the breakdown what what do I need to support and so you know we're trying to put together some good materials of the kinds of things we do all the time that parents can be doing too so that we can figure out okay when I do this when I do this smaller thing and there is more success 
Um, then now I've supported that child. I figured out what they know, where they needed that next step to be. And as one parent said to me, I realize those steps are way smaller than I ever thought they were. There you go. Yeah, right. that's definitely the lower the bar method, isn't right, it? Because right. I think we do imagine that our kids, quote unquote, should be able to do more. Mm -hmm. I like the idea. I don't know if you use this with your students, but I like the idea of asking a child how much energy they think they can commit to a task. Mm -hmm. So when my kids would do copy work, I'd say, well, here's a passage. How much of this can you give focused attention to and give me your most excellent work? Well, we're often not happy with the answer. They'll yeah. say one word, but what would happen if we did allow a child to be successful with the amount they could risk right. and be praised for it and noticed for it and valued for it? So when I hear this, you know, figure out what they know and then act accordingly, I always think about that stretching moment. How big of a stretch should that be? Mm -hmm. And your child can actually guide you and yeah. can help you. And what I find with kids is when I really do allow for that little amount, you know, I really kind of just say, wow, that was great. I'm so impressed with that. Um, then it isn't very long before they'll start to say, hey, I could do two words. I could do three right. words. I think I could do this, you know. Sometimes kids will say to me, I don't think I can do this whole thing. And I'll say, okay, well, how about if I do some of it and you do some of it? How would that be? So I had a little boy we were doing, we were actually doing the exercise that's in the book of the, this is not my hat, where he had to write on a post-it what he thought. And I said, well, how about if you tell me what you think and I'll write some pages, the post-it on some pages and you write the others. How do, what do you think of that? And he said, well, I might be able to do maybe four of them. Well, that was actually a lot. He'd only been doing two. And his mom was like, hey, that'd be great if he did four. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll do four. And then you do four. And so, first of all, now eight are done. And wow. they were all his words, right? Well, then there's only a few more pages. So I just looked at him and I said, look how many you did. You did four. That wasn't even that hard. What do you think? You think you could do, you know, two more and I'll do two more and then we'd be done? And then he's like, well maybe and I said well let's see you know and now if he'd said oh you know I might have backed off but if he was having success and that success showed him success so now if I still pulled out that activity would he say I'm going to do this whole book no he still wouldn't but he knows now he can do more of it than he thought he could and you know that what's that that's working on Will. Now we're over to Will. I was just right? going to say that's a perfect transition to Will because what we're talking about then is the energy level that they want to commit mm -hmm. to that actual task. And I keep in my mind imagining backwards to when I homeschooled and when I was around homeschooling. So much emphasis was put on the quantity of work or what you were getting through, mm -hmm. or how you were getting done, or what you were covering. And very little discussion happened around what was occurring when you did that worksheet. Yeah, For instance, right. it occurred to me recently, you could have a child doing a grammar worksheet, and they could be completely checked out thinking about how to beat that level on a game that they left in the morning. They could be thinking about what they're going to do in the afternoon at their soccer practice. And they're just filling in blanks. And we have some sort of weird reassurance that they learned something. Whereas this feels slower and more deliberate and sometimes seems like you're not covering anything. And yet, here you are, all the way in the learning moment, invested with the child, actually discovering whether they learned something, whether they actually mastered the thing that you set out to offer them. Right. So to me, that's, that's the reason this is different. So it's interesting that you mentioned grammar, because I think we see, um, you know, these different approaches to grammar out there. And, um, you know, that grammar is a difficult task. That's one that, you know, my bucket of skill is thankfully growing but is still not full and um, but oddly I'm starting to have more of a thrill about grammar I never had that before but I will see kids who come to me in in their various programs they have to memorize the seven parts of speech and one of the philosophies out there is that memorize them even before you teach what they mean because just knowing the words is the beginning of understanding a concept and it's interesting as a language therapist because 
it is true we are exposed to some words we don't know what they mean but they don't stick very well till they know what they mean so i have kids who have to make have to memorize these parts of speech nine parts of speech see how good my grammar is it's seven or nine i don't even remember right offhand but anyway <laughs> um because it's not very functional just to know parts of speech right um so first of all kids have a different thrill level about memorizing. Yes. I mean, if you're good at memorizing and you know you can stand up and do it in front of everyone and be good at it, then yeah, you have a little more thrill than someone else. And I don't have a big will for memorizing things that have no content to them. So I think that right there is a problem. But also, I'll have kids who can memorize these things, but they don't even yet know what a subject is. If I say who or what is this sentence about, and they have, they're have they still figuring that out, and then to call it a subject, you know? So you just think about this level of learning. So you had said about lower the bar. What yes. was your phrase again? Lower the bar to experience success. To experience, and I say work to a level of success. And it's the same thing, you know, except I think you're a little more explicit that you have to back it down <laughs> yeah. to get to that level of success. One of the things I like to say is no one learns to swim by drowning. Yes, I love that phrase. And, you know, you are not going to have a will to swim if you're drowning. You certainly are not going to have a thrill you know right but getting to will the will is kind of our disposition toward learning our habits of mind our response tendency so we all had kids whose response tendencies would send us you know in all kinds of directions as we were learning um, but we really want our kids to kind of have these habits of mind this learning how to learn yeah. we also say thinking about how you think Metacognition. Metacognition. <laughs> Talking about how you talk, yes, right? You know, right. Um, you know, putting words around how, what language is, you know, all of those things um, really support this will in our kids, you know. I call that self-awareness. And I think one of the things we don't do enough of when we're interacting with our children is just helping them tune in to themselves. Mm -hmm. We're busy telling all the time what our kids should be doing, how they should behave, what they should think, what they should feel, what they should achieve, instead of actually having them check in with themselves. How do you feel this morning? You got a lot of energy? You feeling a little tired? Are you interested in math? Would, should we start with language? I mean, we don't want to pelt our children with a, a hundred questions. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about that. But there is this level of helping them become self-aware around learning. Mm -hmm. Are there other ways to meaningfully engage the seven or nine parts of speech than memorization? Um, yeah. <laughs> my, <are>. oldest, <laughs> my oldest did not want to memorize her multiplication tables. And I thought, you know, let's just start using them. And pretty soon she'll realize if I would just remember these numbers better, this whole process would be a little faster. So we just moved on to, to continually make her be memorizing them. She was becoming resistive to that. She doesn't like memorizing. Well, she has a great memory. I don't know why she didn't. She didn't like being told to memorize something, you know. So, so fine, move on. Um, it's interesting, too, this idea of that skill will lead, will improve will and will improve thrill. We kind of get that about math in a way that we don't about writing and hmm. reading. Don't hmm. you think? Maybe so. Although I have to say, I think the education I had in math was such a failure because it focused on memorization. Yeah. And I was the person who literally was 34 years old when I finally realized the word multiplication meant multiples. It's the first time I realized that. Mm. And I was using Cuisinair rods and discovered that it was two groups of three or three groups of two, that that's what two times three and three times two meant. I did not know that till my 30s. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a complete failure of right. the education right. system yeah. built from this notion that if you just memorize, you'll be able to plug and chug into these mm -hmm. theorems. Mm -hmm. When I got to the point where multiplication needed to be used in a meaningful way, whether it was fractions or finding common denominators or algebra, <laughs> I was... a tip at a restaurant. Yes, right? I was completely lost. Mm -hmm. And that's because I never got the true lesson. Mm -hmm. All I got were the pieces of it enough to pass this current test, but I didn't know how it fit into the fabric 
of math, and I think it's why I'm such a nut, even in the language area, of making sure that meaning is attached to everything that my kids are doing. I don't want them to memorize the word noun when they're in third grade before they even have the cognitive power to get abstraction. Mm -hmm. Noun is a highly abstract idea, but what are we hoping they'll understand about nouns? Well, we're helping them understand that each word in a sentence plays a kind of role, has a certain relationship to reality. So can I make meaningful connections? Make it functional is well, how we well, say it. Yes, right? mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So we made, um, what we did in third grade is we made parts of speech collages. So we would say, okay, nouns, what are nouns? We'd go through all our magazines and cut out pictures and make a noun collage. And I remember, you know, in, when I was a kid, we'd always say that a noun was a person, place, or thing. Or but idea, it's also or concept, an idea. Right. No, but that was not ever taught when I was a oh, kid. Interesting. That was sort of introduced later. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, how do we represent ideas then? So then we, that moves you right into abstraction, mm -hmm. which actually moves you back to the word noun. Like there's a circle happening there. Right. And I feel like that's what's missing so often in this conversation is, what is it? Why is it? What is the reason we're even spending time looking at this concept? If you can't answer that, why teach it yet? And, you know, you're hitting upon some of what will involves in, you know, the way that these researchers looked at it is it involved this strategic thinking mm. and this ability to kind of um, not quite totally make connections yet, but getting this kind of awareness, you are making some connections. Eventually, that's what's really getting you to the thrill. But just having this, you know, you're, you become that powerful learner because you really realize like, I can do this. I know how this works now. I know if I start to apply, you know, this kind of strategy or this kind of thinking or even this kind of discipline, this kind of time, you know, I'm beginning to learn that about myself and that's really what you know is the habit of mind right it's yeah. you know we want our kids to know even if I don't know it I can learn it and how do I go after that kind of information um, it's that ability to be somewhat sensitive about learning you know so a lot of times I'll start with kids in an evaluation my first beginning of every evaluation is um, I want to talk about you and your learning and I want to know, like, what do you like and what do you not like so much? And then why don't you like those things? Why is that just okay? Why do you love these things, you know? And just helping them to see their relationship with their learning and, and what they feel about themselves that makes them, you know, powerful in some ways. And then what do they feel like would help them in these others? So, you know, that's that's really being a learner. Right? Well, it, the thing of it is, every child that I've ever met is a learner. Uh, every human yes. is a learner. And so part of us, when we sort of um, segment off the school subjects and call that the learning, and then over here when they're playing with dominoes on the floor, it's not, we're actually causing a rift inside the child. The child is discounting all the strategies they learn to, they use to learn when they care. Mm -hmm. And they think it's a different toolkit for school. Right. And, and we don't, we want, don't that. want that. Right. You know, so if you have a child who's really engaged in setting up all the dominoes so that they fall over perfectly, judging the distance, making sure that they're on a level surface, not knocking it over prematurely, why couldn't we investigate that with the child? How did you do that? Mm -hmm. How did you have the patience for that? What drove you forward? Help them to start to actually value the engagement that they perform to make that task happen. Because the same skills apply to these more abstract concepts. Yeah. It's just that they don't know that because we treat them so differently. We act like they're moving to a different state every time we work on mm -hmm. school. And so you're leading us to thrill. Now, yes. in your conversation, yes. you know, this deep learning where yes. they really are making these connections now. Right? I think, yes. I mean, I think at the heart of my pedagogy, if we want to call it that, is making sure that everybody who is involved in the process of education, whether it's the parent or the child or you're learning for yourself, or your child's learning for himself, mm -hmm. you know, educator or child, the goal is for it to be meaningful. And that's what all the research shows. Immediate yep. use. William Rhinesmith says that nothing is retained if it is not meaningfully used by the learner. So that is a powerful challenge to every educator and to a parent. Not 
do it because you'll need it later, not do it to get into college, not do it because I said so, not do it because all second graders are doing it. How is the thing we're talking about right now actually meaningful for this child in this moment? You know, Charlotte Mason's, they're born as persons. We're not, they're not adults in training. Mm -hmm. You know, if these concepts don't have meaning today, how is that a requirement then of their learning journey right, for today. Right, and it's so easy to say, well, they're going to need this, so that's why we need to work on that now, when really what we need now is what we need now. We want yeah. kids making connections with what they're doing now. So when they look, when these researchers looked at, you know, these different kinds of learning, if it was achievement-based, do this now so you can do this, it, or do this so you get the grade. Mm. Spelling test, perfect example. Mm. Just pass this spelling test, right? right? When it's achievement-based, we don't have very good learning. It doesn't stick. The concept's not good. You know, I I did, I w I've always been a weak speller, and I did fine on spelling tests, right? Because I knew how to get through a spelling test. That was achievement learning. But I didn't really know how to spell, yes. and which is why I embrace that as a topic so much now. So then you have this surface level where you're just reproducing, you know, so yeah, okay, I have this word wall, maybe, and now I'm spelling from this word wall, but I still haven't integrated that in any real way. So it made it to this surface. It made it to this paper for this task. And a lot of kids who engage in those two levels, what they learn is how much they can just kind of get by with. Right? Exactly, And our kids did it too. Even strong learners will do this, totally. right? Because, oh, well, I don't care about that class very much. And what I figured out my grade and I only need to get a 60 on my final and I'll still have an A in the class. So I'm not going to study, right? You yes. know, I mean, how many yes. times do you have something like that happen? Because you're, you're just, it's all transactional, right? Yes. But deep learning is relational. Oh, that's so good. So transactional versus relational. And really... Back to Charlotte Mason's, sci all learning is a science of relations. It's mm -hmm. the interconnections. It's actually wallowing in complexity, to use the Allen and Bacon term, uh, that allows us to make the meaningful relationships that generate insight. Yes. That create the new right. that we're after. You know, I did terribly on multiple choice tests for history, psychology, sociology in college, but I got A's on all my written papers. Yeah, right. And that's because I'm great at integrating. I can actually take disparate parts, think about them together, generate something new. Well, the truth is, you get a job in the workplace, you're not taking tests. You're actually meant to take this meaningful information, put it together with your own insight, and generate something new. That is what most workplaces demand today in the 21st century. So we're doing a disservice when we treat learning like it's an accumulation of information that we can spit out. Right. Instead of this sort of grappling with, wallowing in complexity, allowing ourselves to be fascinated, spellbound, drawn, right. in and awe. It, and it leads us back to tasks, right? Yes. Like I'm learning about something and I'm making these connections to other things I know and I'm thinking, I, I want to learn more about this. And all totally. of a sudden, so that's the cyclic part about it, yes. you know, that you were saying, you're right. Probably being on a continuum isn't quite right. Making it a circle is a little more, you know. Because you might have access through any number of these. It, right. it could come to you because yes. you catch a vision and it looks like it would be really fun to ride the unicycle. Mm -hmm. Well, so then that leads you to have the will to build the skill. Right. But then you may have this other, like Liam told me when he was learning to read, he told me that he saw all the people older in the family than him reading, and he knew that's what all the cool people were doing. So he was going to teach himself to read. <laughs> and that's how he approached it, you know, and he was my earliest reader mm -hmm. as a result. Mm -hmm. But then there is also that other piece I was thinking when you were talking about skill, of learning to play the piano. Right. So you may even think I want to play because it, music is beautiful, but you really cannot even get to the thrill until you've done your matching your fingers to the keys and doing one hand at a time. And right. that very first day that the two hands come together, it's magic. Right. But you couldn't have that magic without starting on the skill side. So I really agree with you. I think you can come through any of these ports of entry. Right, right. But we, but the, the more... The more we are successful, the more it meets who we are as people, yes. the more thrill we're going to have. Totally. And, um, and what could also be good 
is maybe this particular subject area isn't my sweet spot, but I've learned enough to appreciate it. Yes. And so I have a will for this, you know, that's maybe not as thrilling, but it's okay. But wait a minute, I just made a connection here. And now that became even more thrilling. So, you know, just like I was talking about with spelling, I didn't have natural skill. I actually have, you know, weakness in some areas that would cause me to be a poor speller. I loved writing. I never wanted to do it where anyone would see it. Interesting. Right? Because then they would know I was a bad speller. So hated spelling. You know, the will was only to get by. I started to want to be better so that I wouldn't be found out. Right? (laughs) And then all of a sudden I started learning some things and making connections and I love teaching spelling and I've improved my spelling from it, right? So all of a sudden spelling is interesting. Well, that is what can happen. It's sometimes it's finding those relations and intersections that are more natural to who we are, right? Um, But it's also what you were describing with piano. It's a little of the tiger mom theory of... There's a little bit of you got to get good enough. Yes. To start to enjoy to it. To start to enjoy it. Right. And I, I remember Jacob was taking saxophone lessons as a homeschooled student. And so he was playing saxophone completely alone, you know, in a bedroom <laughs> for no one. Yeah. That gets old. Yeah. And so after two years of this, he wanted to quit. But I knew that there was this amazing marching band in our local school district and he was planning to go to that freshman school for two hours a day. And I said to him, I said, just keep taking lessons one more year. I'm not going to let you quit because I just have this vision you don't have yet. I think when you are in this marching band, you will see the reason that you were learning and you'll be so glad that I didn't let you quit. So he trusted me because we had built a good relationship. Mm -hmm. So he kept practicing very poorly, but he kept at it. And then he joined the band and immediately the vision was cast and he was the worst saxophone player in the whole band. He was the last chair. And by the end of his freshman year, he was first chair because you know, Jacob. Yeah, right. (laughs) But his will got caught, right? It's not that he didn't have a will. This kid had will out the wazoo, Mm -hmm. but there was no vision for the implementation. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, it was being in a context that gave him that motivation. But then on top of it, by the end, he was pleasurably playing the sax because he had given himself that discipline to get it done. Right, right. And so you can really see how the thrill there really does develop these habits of mind. Yes. Right? Yes. And you weren't going to get habits of mind before thrill. You no. You needed in that case there to be some thrill. You, you know, know, I just want to so. keep coming back to this concept of self-awareness because mm-hmm. bottom line, it's both people, right? It's also the parent. Like if the parent is really hating a subject, that is going to absolutely translate in the way she presents it or the way he presents it uh, in the way that they treat the value of the subject Um, Maybe you hate something that you are sure is essential. Oh, that's got to be the worst combination ever, right? Right. You know it's essential, but you hate it. So now everybody's locked in this hell of hard work and no joy. But I guess if we could at least admit those pieces Mm -hmm. and start from there, Mm -hmm. like what you said about spelling, I know I don't like it. Maybe I want to get better at it so it doesn't keep hounding me. I felt that way about math. I was like, we have to approach math in a way that doesn't make me crazy. Mm -hmm. These actually help us get there, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the quotes I want to share is, there is from uh, D.N. Perkins, there are three psychological components, sensitivity and inclination and confidence in one's own ability. And I think that's important because just like my spelling example, I see it with kids who are struggling readers and writers, is you want to help get to a point where they are more confident in their ability. And um, and all that avoidance, you know, I just didn't write ever in front of anyone. Mm. Well, that was very limiting to me, right? And, and not being able to read is limiting, right? So to really help kids you know this is my big mission in life here is to help kids gain in their confidence as a reader and a writer you know that they're not avoiding it and they're not seeing themselves because because there is a point like you said with your math you 
you knew you had to get to a certain point to feel good about where you were yes. at, right? And and I see that too, you yeah. know, and that's a reason to, you know, lead us back to, for some of those kids, reading might always be a struggle, but there is a thrill in knowing that they now have more confidence in themselves, yes. you know, and that's so important. Well, I love this idea of paying attention to sensitivity and inclination and confidence in your own ability. And the word that jumped out at me actually was sensitivity. I think if we could all just be more sensitive to one another and to believe our children when they present their own limits to us, mm -hmm. it, it won't look articulate. Kids don't say to, to no. us, you know, I'm really struggling with my self-confidence about math. They say, I hate math. <laughs> right. So we and need, it's stupid. And right? it's stupid. And, and I'll never we'll never this. need yeah. it. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, those are the standard responses. Yeah. Right. So if you hear one of those flags go up, mm -hmm. that's a moment for you to be sensitive. You right. can do the translation work for them. You can say, oh, math is hard. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I didn't enjoy it as much when I was a kid. I wonder if there's a different way we can come at it today. Yeah, you know, right. we can provide that sensitivity. Right, we can, we can. And keep trying to make it deep learning. Yes. You know, um, because yeah. that is in the end what real learning is, right? Yes. And learning happens best in relationship. We both know it. <laughs> so you keep doing what you're doing because it's really building thrill to will to skill. And I'll yes. keep doing what I'm doing, the skill to will to thrill. And we'll meet in the middle. We'll and the middle. I love working with you. Yes. And thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you for listening to the Rooted In podcast. For more information, resources, and products, please visit rootedinlanguage.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, and like our Facebook page.